Hello and welcome to the Peak Endurance Podcast. Episode 174 is a second interview with Lincoln Quilliam, <clears throat> Finder and Race Director for the Kanani Mountain Run. Now, when I interviewed Lincoln, he was overseas in Scotland as part of his work for the Churchill Fellowship. Churchill Fellowships offer a diverse range of people, so not just for trail running, from all walks of life, an opportunity to travel overseas for four to eight weeks to explore a topic or issue that they are passionate about. The topic of people's proposed projects, that's hard to say, it's like a tongue twister, are limitless as long as they provide a benefit to Australia and the person who is doing it is willing to share their findings with the Australian community. So obviously Lincoln is very passionate about trail running and he went to Europe to investigate the key features and benefits of aspirational trail running destinations with the findings um, being used to help him to apply these features and benefits to Australian trail running. So in this interview, we discuss the state of European racing and how we can apply that to Australia. I sure hope you enjoy it. It was a great chat. Now, don't forget, please, to show your support for the show by rating, reviewing and subscribing. The link is in the show notes and I truly appreciate your support and I love reading the reviews. Now, in spite of saying normal polls clinics, I've been inundated by people needing to learn pole skills for their upcoming races. So I have one more for the year and I promise this really is the last one and it is the 6th of November. So go to my website or find the link in the show notes to join me to learn all about how to use poles uphill, downhill, on the flats, how to stow them or carry them when you're not using them and how to actually run with poles because that's a special skill in and of itself. This session is guaranteed to help you in your next trail race or ultra. Anyway, enjoy the episode, enjoy my chat with Lincoln and yep, I will catch you next time. Bye. Hi, Lincoln, and welcome back to the Peak Endurance Podcast. How's Hi, it? Isabel. Great to be back. Yeah, yeah here, now in, we've... Uh, here in Scotland, and um, we may have some connectivity uh, quirks, as <laughs> as we may do, but um, yeah, great to be with you. Yeah, and, and that's to be expected. So what I'll let you do is I'll let you do most of the talking. Um, so you're in Scotland, as you just said. What have you just done in Scotland? What was the purpose of your visit there? Yeah, so I'm, I'm here for a Churchill Fellowship, and, and we'll get to that in a minute. But uh, but yesterday I ran the, the famous Glencoe Skyline, part of the Salomon um, Skyline Scotland Running Festival. It's uh, uh, pretty much the biggest um a uh, festival of sky runs and trail runs in uh, in the UK, uh, put on by Array of Events. Um, and wow, these guys are professionals. I learned a lot myself, um, but far out. The, the mountains here surrounding Glencoe and uh, in, in the in the Scottish Highlands are, are just amazing. They do remind me of home a little bit. Uh, they are geologically quite old. They are quite different. I mean perhaps more similar to uh, the Darren Mountains around um, uh, in Fiordland in, in New Zealand in in, uh, in how they're shaped, but just epic ridge lines, super steep to get out of the valley, straight up to the tops, you know, 1,000 metre vert, straight out of the wow. valley. And uh, so it was four, 52 kilometres and 4,750 metres of vert, and I felt every one of them... Um, <laughs> yesterday in the 12 hours it, it ended up taking me but uh gee, yeah there'll be a bit of a, a write-up on on the heaviest bonk i've ever had oh no <laughs> <laughs> how did that happen you didn't have enough food or you were just just the cold or what was it specifically it was definitely nutrition Definitely. I, I just didn't plan a good breakfast. And then, you know, I, I don't really um, use gels and that may change soon. But, you know, then it's like, well, it's it's whatever sort of, you know, um, lollies I can find that are similar to what I use back home um, mm. in different countries. And it doesn't, 
it doesn't always work. And then it was planning between um, between aid stations or, or yeah checkpoints and, and aid stations, and that planning wasn't right. And anyway, lots of lessons. I'm I'm absolutely fine planning for a, uh, a wilderness mission because it's a lot more real food, uh, which I love. But uh, races, yeah, I've still got <laughs> still got a way to go to get that dialed. Yeah, yeah, it is a bit different. It, am I correct in believing it's a highly technical run as well? Extremely technical. We got nothing like it in Australia. Um, so there's there's a, a couple of ridge lines there, which it's it's real scrambling. Like oh. it's actual mountaineering. You know, e- easy mountaineering, but it's 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 actual scrambling with high consequence. Um, you know, if you slip, you, you're going to be falling a very long way and pro- may not be coming back, sort of thing. So, oh, wow. so it's it's the real deal, and and so that's extreme sky running is basically what that is. And I've done a couple of um, other uh, you know extreme sky runs over here, and they they put that name on on, on it themselves in that in that category because there's different levels of sky runs. So the Kanani Mountain Run um, uh, in Tassie is is sky running, but it is the lowest level in terms of technicality and exposure and, and consequence. Whereas yeah, Tromso Sky Race and this one, and then Matterhorn Old Tracks Extreme, completely different level. Yeah. But, and do you yeah, have to prove that you're at a certain ability level to be able to do that race? For this one at Glencoe, yes, absolutely. There's pretty strict, um, uh, you, you know, can run uh, the distance, but mainly can climb and yeah. do have um, a real scrambling experience in the mountains because, you know, you got 30 plus K and 3,000 metres, or oh, hang on, no, 4,000 metres vert in your legs already, and then you get up on this this epic, like, full scrambling ridge line, and, and it's raining and everything's oh. slippery and you're cold and, you know, I, I passed a couple of people who were, were having a, a bit of bit of fun on that ridge. Oh. Um, were you scared at yeah. all? I wasn't, no. No, I love that stuff. Okay. Yeah, that's good. That's, that's good. That's what I love the most. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'd be scared. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's definitely it's definitely something to be scared of. Mm. Definitely. It's, it's real deal. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Now, you alluded to the fellowship that you're there for. Can you just tell the listeners a bit more about what that is? Yeah, absolutely. So... The Churchill Fellowship is, um, or the Church- Winston Churchill Trust um, in Australia, uh, was formed when uh, Churchill passed away in the 60s. And since then, every year, a, handf- a handful of Australians are selected um, on application to travel overseas on a topic of, of their choice that they're already uh, completely um, involved in back home and need to now um travel overseas to learn world's best practice to bring home for for community benefit so that's where the rubber really hits the road it's all about bringing bringing back for community benefit and implementing um or or, you know working with the stakeholders um back home or, or the right people to uh to look at implementing those learnings for for community benefit so my topic is to explore the key features and benefits of aspirational trail running destinations. So I've been on a bit of a trip, um, started in Colorado with Hard Rock 100, uh, spent some time around Boulder and the Front Range there, and then uh, Washington State up north, then came over to, um, to Europe, to Tromso in Norway. And um, so I'm, I'm, I've raced a couple um, to get that experience and particularly, um, yeah. you know, everything around uh, the inside of events as well as um, uh, being, um, you know, talking with all the event organisers and the like. But there, yeah, more on where, I'm, where, I'm, where I did go, then went to Switzerland, so for Sierra and Arles, uh, then, uh, which has been running for, you know, almost 50 years, so one of the longest... Uh, races in in Europe uh, us in, uh, in the, uh, the first runs up here in uh, 
in England and, and hill runs in Scotland have been going for, for hundreds of years, it seems. So, or, so um, yeah, there's different different levels of history in that. Um, after Switzerland went to uh, Chamonix for UTMB, uh, couldn't miss that one. And wow, what a what a crazy experience that was. Uh, pretty much a week long. Um, anyway, we can get into that. The uh, then went to um, where do we go. It's all it's all almost a blur. <laughs> and wow. then went to um, Italy for the Sky Running World Champs. So I, I wasn't on the team. I'm not. I'm not that fast. That's for sure. But uh, was um, supporting the team, part of the part of the um, management team, I guess. Then came here to Scotland, and um, I must say it's it's absolutely lovely to be here. Um, I've got. Uh, then just uh, tomorrow we're going to Keswick in uh, in England, the Lax District, for a week, and then looking forward to going home. So, so how long have you been away getting we, all this done? How long has that taken? Uh, so all up, it'll be almost three months. Wow! So I've aimed to spend sort of <clears throat> around ten days in place 10 days to two weeks and and why so long is um i really want to engage with all the all the stakeholders around trail running similar to you know what what i've engaged with um back home and that's um of course the event organizers themselves then the participants and runners volunteers support crew um local suppliers who are um, providing services for the events, local residents, quite importantly, and mm. local businesses. And, and uh, because a large amount of people coming in on a, uh, quite often a small town, uh, is, is a big impact of, of that amount of people and how that is managed and how the events manage those impacts and, and share the benefits is, is really um, uh, quite interesting. And, and I must say, uh, a lot of these well-established events, because I've travelled to, you know, the most prestigious um, events, they are the most prestigious, and and that not only because they're really amazing uh, races for the trail running community, they've done a really good job of um, of working well with the uh, with the local the land managers or parks authorities, uh, local businesses and the like, so that um, impacts are, are identified and managed. Uh, properly and and how are you hoping to apply what you've learned to your races that you're holding or can I you yeah no there's um uh, so many little things so so many little things and and really you can group them into um uh you know operational efficiency i guess um and also community so how how can um, you know how, how how do we make a better experience for the participants and and also volunteers and the like? So, um, particularly here in in Scotland, um, array events are wow, super professionals at at uh, at the operations side of things. It's a, it's a really well oiled machine and 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 great to see. Um, workforce and, and staffing is, is of course a, a pretty significant one and that, that has a uh, direct relationship with how smooth things run uh, and also branding and presence and um, uh, not only at the event hub itself but throughout the town and of course UTMB far out you know branding absolutely everywhere on the on the major highway you know coming through uh, and all that sort of thing so um uh, no, it, it was also really great. Um, uh, expectations are an amazing thing. And I didn't know I had them coming over, but I, I guess I thought, I, I discovered that I thought that, um, you know, the US and Europe, you know, had everything dialed, right? They'd, they'd resolved all issues, you know, they're a mature trail running um, uh, scene. And, um, well, lo and behold, no. <laughs> of course not. There's <laughs> there's always there's issues always a human factor. Yeah, ex exactly. And and um, 
so what I found was we're already doing a lot of things really, really well back home. Not just my event, but Australia in general. And it's not just events. Um, so the the um, the groups that I'm, the stakeholder groups that I'm getting in touch with here. Um, so I spoke everything around the events. Uh, also land managers or parks authorities, um, private and public, and uh, tourism organisations uh, and a really important one is running clubs and the function that they or the role that they play in building the local community uh, from a social uh, and community aspect, but also from a performance aspect. So some some clubs are purely social in nature and other clubs, and, and usually the more established clubs, um, also have a strong training and performance focus. So there's a, the uh, Ben Nevis run here that's been going for 100 years outside of the Skyline Scotland event, um, you know, has... That's where Finley Wild, who's you know won a won a few things around the Alps recently. That's 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 where he grew up in that club, winning the Ben Nevis for like ten years in a row, and then off he goes to conquer um, other other races around the Alps. And uh, yeah, so we're already um, like back home, or well, at least in Tassie, the running club aspect uh we're doing really well in and that's the, you know strong community building is coming out of that so so yeah i mean this this thousand i'm i'm still in the capturing the information phase and there's so much um so many thoughts chung, 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 you know flying around everywhere still a bit it's um it's going to take i'm looking forward to the to the long plane ride home as long as my um seven month old son charlie is <laughs> going to be okay <laughs> getting the computer out and really you know distilling these thoughts into you know in, into a structured way because i've got a lot of um uh presenting at the sustainable trails conference in november in st helens in tassie and have uh you know workshops lined up with uh the parks authorities in tassie and um and councils and the like in the tourism industry down there when i get back um so that uh, you know, that's part of disseminating the, the findings. So, and so when you say yeah. you're with parks, are you going to say like how how those races overseas are impacting the environment and how we can perhaps, um, you know, project that it may with increased numbers influence here? Is that what you Yeah, well, some of the main points. Yeah, some of the main points with parks is is how trails are managed for yeah. trail running, yeah. and and there's a couple of really clear um, things. And one is that uh, the trail runners are not seen any different from a management perspective to to hikers or bushwalkers. That pedestrians out on the trails have equal rights of access and uh, and, and don't impact the um the trails any more than hikers in fact um when i when i asked this question um uh, of of a number of parks authorities they, they actually chuckled it's like what what do you mean but the question is oh do trail runners have any more impact than than hikers and and their answer was no actually it's the it's the reverse um you know trail runners you know don't uh uh, don't overnight there's no camping and trampling from the camping and food scraps and uh, lots of toileting and all that sort of stuff I just like to travel and go for a lovely run like yeah, yeah. They're, they're they're really great and respectful they don't get oh here's and, and another key one is um <clears throat> trail runners don't get rescued Ah, effectively yeah and, and that's just that's from the data the rescue data shows that trail runners uh almost never get rescued because um or and and i guess surmising I, it's because trail runners are more in tune with their uh skills and experience and uh, and level of comfort and and stick within that or or push perhaps quite gradually and are very well prepared uh, it seems so. So that that's an amazing one, and and so that's that's one that we had thought of back home. But um, yeah, there's the the rescue services don't get the data on on who um, on who it is yet. 
And, and that's uh, another runners are also a little bit more um, self-sufficient and cognizant of, of accidents that could happen as well, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, I think more uh, more aware of the risks and and um, yeah and, and and dealing with them. So no, it's um, that was that was good to good to hear. Uh, another um, aspect for parks authorities is uh, is track construction and maintenance, particularly maintenance. And uh, and, and what we what I've seen out here is that well, there's always a backlog of maintenance, <laughs> no matter where you are. But uh, but uh, in the you know one of the national US agencies and, and many others uh, make it very easy for volunteer groups to come in and help. Um, and and you know provide provide support and and uh, there's even you know really good training programs for crew leaders uh, for volunteer organisations um, uh, put on by the by the the um, uh, land management agencies so US Forest Service for example so that um, you know the crew leaders from the volunteer organisations could be trained up to um, you know to the standards and and the like and um, uh, and off, off you go. So that's something that's that's quite difficult uh, back home, at least in Tassie. Um, yeah. But yeah, uh, uh, you know, parks uh, agencies are, are pretty under resourced back home, so, so it makes it difficult. And also, would you find that um, you know, with Australia having you know a lower population compared to um, you know European countries, that that would have an effect too? Definitely. In so many regards, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, low population and large land area, yeah. uh, you know, lower lower revenue, and perhaps we have um, uh, or lower tax revenue for, to support the parks services, and perhaps we have uh, a higher amount or longer total distance of, of tracks and trails to to manage compared to um, the resources available to do it, and that's why it makes so much sense to encourage the you know volunteer organizations who want to contribute to come in and help help maintain um but yeah it, it, it was quite common across the board except for um the central alps so you know france and and, and italy it was quite common that um, everywhere else um, you know, volunteer organizations do uh play a, a good part in in maintaining the trails and that would be from the running clubs themselves? To some degree. Uh, in the US, not really, no. It was very much uh, the, you know, outdoors, because the people who want to uh, help maintain the trails are not necessarily runners. I mean, a lot of, a lot of bushwalkers. Lots and lots of mountain bikers. Mountain biking um, I was going to say, mountain really bikers strong, are good at it, yeah. Very good. Um, and it's that's because there's a strong need for it. Yeah. Whereas for trail running, there is not a strong need because the trails are already there. We can run on them, you know, pretty much no matter what the condition is, as long as they're not crazy overgrown. Yeah. Um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, there was a pretty scathing um, uh, article that came out in 2018 about trail runners being a bit lazy on the trail maintenance um uh, looks like yeah. you know the one yeah and, and yeah. some pretty interesting response to um and it, it's not it's not necessarily the case i mean certainly for hard rock and other events you know th there's an expectation that you put in trail maintenance and and i was over there for for the rock weekend of trail maintenance and and yeah it was a great experience and uh, uh there's a lot of um a lot of good knowledge and and skill and 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 care for the trails um from the trail running community in the u.s and but what, no it's they, so colorado about, club and, when you talk about trail maintenance, what sort of things are people doing uh, the the volunteer led trail maintenance is is the is the real basic stuff keeping the trails um, open so trimming vegetation so it's not a bush bash um, which yeah. also assists navigation because yeah if it's overgrown you can't see where the track is people get lost and we've had that back home um, just on the back of the mountain actually which is really unfortunate um, and 
uh, so yeah, fallen trees, lots of uh, lots of chainsaw or, or um, big in in the US, it's big cross cut saws, uh, which are pretty cool. Uh, and then tread work, so the actual formation of the trail, you know, where you get little landslides and clearing those up to to um, to have a, uh, a, a a nice you know actual track to to run on, and drainage. Drainage, drainage, drainage. Absolute number one. After the veg clearing, it's all about drainage because if the water is to get on the trail and run down it, then it's, you know, it gets smashed in two seconds. So really good cross drains, <clears throat> water bars and the like to ensure the water that does get on the um, on the trail gets off as soon as possible. And that's that's been a really dominant thing I've seen everywhere is the maintenance of the drainage or, or lots of drainage is put in to start with and then it's maintained really regularly and and that'll be something I'll be speaking of very loudly when I get back. <laughs> and, and that would help with erosion and all that sort of stuff too, like stop that happening as much. 100%, yeah. 100%. Oh, and the, yeah. the other yeah. other key one is as soon as the trail requires it, invest in hardening the trail. So um, that's, yeah, get out, get a stone crew out to, um, to, to put some stone pitching in if it's, if it's really steep and an erosion gully is forming. And, uh, you know, we use a lot of timber and, and, FRP or fiber reinforced um, polymer or plastic or whatever it is back home. Uh, whereas everywhere else I'm seeing here, stone is uh-huh. is really the, um, uh, the the main track hardening uh, material, and it's natural. It looks so much better, and it doesn't burn in a bushfire. It just yeah, is point. a bit more expensive. So yeah, yeah, and and that's always a consideration, isn't it? And and I guess. Um, that's what we've got to try and balance out, I, I suppose, in, in Australia. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, there's, there's no easy wins, but um, certainly I guess onto the benefits. We, you know, it's been very, um, very consistent that there's significant health benefits of having trails yeah. and uh a, an amazing policy I've seen in Norway and uh, in one of the cities I was at in, or a couple that I was at in uh, the US, was a policy, and it's a city policy, um, of having a trail within 10 minutes walk or within even 500 metres of every resident's house. Wow, that's now, awesome. Yeah. I love so that. that so that residents have a place to walk and, and run, um, you know, out their back door. Now, I mean, someone like Hobart is extremely lucky that we've got, you know, heaps of bushland all out the back of everyone's or mo- uh, most um, suburbs, but I doubt that, that Hobart would meet that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and mm-hmm. and so many other cities and so that, that's actually a planning aspect yeah. and uh you know and can be retrofitted uh, to some degree into existing um suburbs it's a bit hard but certainly any new planning applications and and master plans and zoning and all that sort of stuff um so that, that i was i was blown away by that i wasn't expecting that and and the the health benefits and community benefits I was seeing out of that were, were extraordinary. Now, it's not, and, and health, it's not just physical health, it's mental health and well-being, And, yeah. and that's, you know, really well known. There's heaps of research on get exercising outdoors. Um, 100% is a direct correlation to, to well-being. Um, and uh, community building, it's, you know, connecting with your neighbours out on these trails, you know, just even a high. Yeah. Uh, over time, that high will, you know, might turn into a conversation or, or at least, you, you you know, you're seeing the same people out um, and it builds a, a sense of community. Yeah. Now, there's the another one I was, uh, wasn't ready um, or, or wasn't expecting was Boulder, Colorado, um, has 
uh, or part of the driver for them to have so much, so much amazing trails right on the um, outskirts of the city, or, or all around the city, I should say, is to attract good people yeah. to come and live in their city, and not just good people to attract um, companies and particularly even startups. That actually was, I know, one of their focuses. Because you can come and live in Boulder and in your lunchtime, head out onto the trails. Yeah. yeah. So having that accessibility of the trails and that outdoor lifestyle, that nature right there was a, was a huge, um, uh, you know, a draw card that they saw for, for their city and, and it was working. Mm. So um, uh, that's, that's quite an interesting one. I don't know... Oops, you've just dropped out. Um, we, I hope, I think we'll come back. A bit of a tricky yes, one. How right, much that we, resonates. Uh, sorry, just lost you there for a sec. Yep, I got you in now. Yep, so you were just saying you don't know if if that, I, I mean, I'm assuming you mean could be correlated to Australia with, with Boulder? you again. Oh. Okay, let's hope Lincoln comes back. There we go. Got you yep, again. I've got you. Yep. Yep. So sorry, you were saying you're not sure with Boulder. I'm assuming you meant whether it correlates to Australia. Seems to be that question. I think um, Zoom doesn't like that question somehow. Let's hope he comes back soon. This is always the difficulty with um, podcasting. There we go with overseas guests. So anyway, <laughs> it's all part of. I'm just rambling along here, so there's not silence for the listeners. <laughs> so um, I don't know what's happening with the uh, the connection. Um, it could be you, but it also could be me because I am hot spotting off my mobile phone. But I'm thinking it's you because um, you're freezing. Um, so there we go. Um, All right, so keep going. There we go. Oh, yep. Okay, so um, where do I get to? I, I think. Um, it was... No, lost you again. We might have to. It was uh, Boulder and the. Uh, uh... Sorry. Sorry. Yep. Keep going. Oh, uh, yep. Gotcha. Yep. Yeah. So, so Boulder is. Um, uh, that that policy of the tracks and trails within uh, close distance of um, of people's houses, and also they've secured, you know, the the Ironbound Range and that whole Front Range as public lands with heaps of amazing trails. They're attracting um, uh, really great people and and companies to to move there, so that um, uh, so that they uh, uh, that then has a really positive economic and social and community. Um, uh, feed through and, and development of the city long term yeah yeah i mean i certainly know when i went to boulder i mean it's just got a whole vibe about it that is very attractive for the outdoor athlete yeah and that's right i um this is probably where we where we uh, cut off um not sure how much that would resonate back home with our population size and scale and 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 of course we don't have too many cities really competing in that regard i'm not sure <laughs> i'm not in that sort of space myself so i don't really know but I, I all i know is that um say bright in victoria has has a similar sort of vibe about it and and a similar sort of location with easy access to trails so i mean that's mm. yeah. Oh, and definitely now with, you know, like um, everyone having or supposed to having great internet access, <laughs> uh, connectivity, then any sort of tech companies or whatever, you know, they can set up anywhere, right? So, yeah. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And so when you compare um, racing overseas to Australia, do you think, like, we don't have anything quite that technical um, in Australia. Do you think mm. that could ever be a thing here? Or do you think, oh, well, uh, policies and laws would get in the way of that i would love to see a couple of these pop up in australia um selfishly because that's what i absolutely love um and you know and there's a couple of uh a couple of routes in in tassie that that would uh that would go but the um 
and I'm sure it would be across Australia as well, but uh, the land managers or parks authorities just would really shy away from it, yeah. I think. That's um, right. And, yeah, and it's, it's quite quite interesting how deep parks authorities want to get into your documentation and all this sort of stuff and how risk averse they really are and sort of jumping at shadows a little. Oh, did I say that? <laughs> um, <laughs> that's all right. I'm sure none of, uh, well, anyway. Um, everyone, I think everyone knows because, what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, because like over here and, you know, using Scotland as a, as a more relevant example compared to say the, the Alps, um, you know, once a demonstration of professionalism and that, that, you know, you've got everything sorted, then it's really just, well, hey, have you, it, you, you know, further years, oh, have you got your insurance? Yeah. Cool. Well, we know you, you know what you're doing. We've already worked out all the issues with you in, in year one and then you just work out any issues in year two and three and, and, and off you go. Yeah. Um, uh, because you know why would why would they waste their time delving their nose deep into events business when that's not their business they're not you know they're not there to understand they're not events professionals yeah. and they say that themselves of course so it's like well just let us get on with our job <laughs> we, we've got it covered it, it, it is very important of course to have um when a new operator comes in to to you know, do the due diligence effectively that they they are know what they're doing and all that sort of thing, and that's where um, industry associations call them, or, or you know, the Tasmanian Trail Running Association or American Trail Running Association or the like, uh, or it, here the uh, Scottish Hill Runners or Fell Runners Association. Those associations then have a really, you know, can perform that that function of vetting the you know new event organizers because yeah. they have um the skills and experience to to be able to do that on behalf of parks authorities and yeah. so that's uh you know a lot of smaller scale events do go through like scottish hill runners or or, or um uh, the fell runners association large events which are you know really professional organizations through uh, you know skyline scotland for example don't really do that um because you know they're they're a huge you know big professional organization that, that does this day in day out whereas of course a lot of other smaller or grassroots event organizers that's you know they'll do one or two really small events a year but um but yeah the associations um, or trial running associations do could have that role to play to be that bridge and, and assist parks authorities and make it make it easier um, easier for them to be able to support the trial running um, events community because yeah we definitely um, it's a lot a lot of hard work uh, in Australia compared to everywhere everywhere else I've seen some some places like oh so Norway and Scotland have free right of access for the public to outdoor lands even on a private land so wow. it's all man's written or all man's right oh, so all all man's right or all person's right it, it should be um, in Norway uh, and um, in Scotland it's a Scottish outdoor access code it's effectively a right to roam any member of the public can enter any outdoor lands as long as it's not you know someone's residence or you know a fenced yard full of stock or whatever um and and as long as they do it responsibly and they can camp for a night or two oh, wow. and this sort of thing so in scotland and norway you actually i think technically don't even need to get land manager permits oh to hold the right because of that because there's yeah, because there's no or landowner permits yeah. because there's no differentiation between commercial events and public access, and so land manager um, or landowner permits or approvals aren't actually technically required. Of course, you you know typically you wouldn't just do it without you know talking to yes. them and getting their their yes. consent, formal or not. Yeah. Um, but 
um, that's just so, you know, when I found that out, well, really? That's, yeah. that's I mean, story. I know it's happened with so many races over here that races have had to be cancelled because they just can't get the permits. And there's like so many permits and so many hoops to jump through. And it's just crazy. <clears throat> yeah, it, it is. And it's, it's, it not only does it stifle our community here to some yeah. degree, it, you, it's, they're just burning out event organisers and, and people don't want to even consider putting on events. It's just too hard. So um, Tasmanian Trail Runners Running Association, that is what we think is going to be part of our role moving forward. It's going to take a couple of years to get there. Um, uh, so, yeah, I'm the vice president of, of that. Um, yeah, a few things to, to work through there, of course. Uh, and then there has there isn't a national trail running association in Australia, no. but there is a group. Um, so uh, led by Queensland and 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 Tassie and and others, uh, are, you know, really keen on 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 where this is heading. But to set up a, um, I think it's to set up a national association. But certainly working towards getting trail running in uh, Brisbane 2032. Oh, nice. So that would be awesome. There is a, yeah, there is a um, landing website out um, to uh, have a quick look at and yeah. uh, there should be a mailing list in there. I really, that's all, this has all just happened in the last um, sort of month or so while I've been away, so I'm not, not clued in on it. But, um, yeah, that's check exciting. that out. Um, it's, it's an exciting space yeah because basically we we need to get trail running recognized as an official sport by sport australia and all of those formalities and governance and all that sort of stuff um which is it's interesting yeah and and i think it a national, a national organization would be good yeah and, and, you know, they'd align under the International Trail Running Association and then the state-based would, would align under there and then the state organisations could um, have that function of working with the land managers um, so that, yeah, that, that yeah. become the bridge and, and, and assist everyone, yeah. Yeah, and, 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 I, and I think you're right, it would add legitimacy to our, um, um, our races and all that sort of stuff and, and would help, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, oh, well, that's that's a lot of interesting stuff that you're doing. Thank you so much for coming onto the podcast today, especially after your big run yesterday. And to be honest, I'm seeing like a lot of fog. You, it looks pretty cold there. <laughs> What's the temperature? Yeah, well, I've got the jacket on. It's probably yeah. 10 degrees. Oh, that's I not think. too bad. That's so awesome. it's, not, it's not too bad. Unfortunately, we can't really see too many hills here, yeah, but that's quite of the hills. Bit. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there we go. There we go. Um, yeah. that's, that's not a mountain, of course. That's just a no. tiny little hill yeah. right there. There we go. I'll just get out of it. And, <laughs> um, but, oh, there's, there we go. So I was, I was up there. Oh, was, nice. Uh, um, and that, that's not, you know, one of the sharp ones, of course. Yeah. Yeah. But um, it, it's, what a lovely place. Yeah, it looks it beautiful. Is. Yeah. I, I love thanks, Scotland. Thanks for having me, Scotland. Yeah, I've, I've got to go back again. You're making me jealous. <laughs> yeah, well, I've been thinking um, a lot of these places I'm going, there's so many of you know my mates back home who would love it. And yeah. um, I've got a lot of Scottish mates back home, actually. Ah. There's a lot of Scottish expats in, um, in yeah. Tassie. Well, maybe everywhere, as, yeah. as there is every national or most nationalities. But yeah. Um, they're all doctors for some reason, and oh. um, they're, they're all in Tassie, and they all trail run. So uh, anyway. That's, that's an interesting um, dynamic group there, isn't it? Yeah, that's that's funny. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well. No, I'd right. love to sort out some some trips, you know, to because yeah. uh, uh, it's, it's all more fun with crew. Yes, yeah, 100%. I agree. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us, and um, I will um, – Put links to as much as possible um, of what you've been up to and some of the races and that sort of stuff. Um, and yeah, thanks for sharing your experience over there and, and how you're going to apply it here. It's, it sounds like exciting times ahead. Yeah, awesome. Thanks so much for, for having me, Isabel, and uh, looking forward to.
to getting my thoughts a bit more collated, directed, and uh, and sharing those with you and the listeners a yeah. bit later. That would be awesome. I'd love that. All righty. Thanks for that. All right. Cheers. Bye.